Welcome, welcome to this Scouter Talks uh, webinar on, on a diversifying society. Who am I? I'm a, a professor of finance at Alto University and the chairman of the board uh, of the Kauta Foundation. Kauta Foundation is a foundation uh, that supports research in the areas of business as well as in all technological fields. I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, the team at Alto University as well as Thomas Olko from the Kauta Foundation for putting together uh, these webinars. We have a series of three webinars out of which this is the second one. The Diversifying Society webinar will be guided by Rebecca Piakkari, who is one of the leading professors at the Alta University School of Business. I hope you will enjoy, or I'm certain that you will enjoy this, this inspiring morning uh, that, uh, that Rebecca is, is bringing to you together with our speakers. Welcome again. Thank you, Matti, for opening this webinar. My name is Rebecca Piekkari, and I'm Markus Wallenberg, Professor of International Business at Aalto University. And I'm also the chair of the Diversity and Equality Group at the School of Business. It is my great pleasure to moderate this webinar today. The theme is diversity and inclusion in organizations. And I'm happy to tell you that this year, 2021, has been dedicated to research-based knowledge. Our event is part of this year's official program, which is a joint initiative organized by the Ministry of Education and Culture, the Academy of Finland and the Federation of Finnish Learned Societies. In the first webinar on data-driven future, in which some of you probably participated, Eero Korhonen from Google and Meri Hataja from Saidot talked about the importance of team diversity. Members of teams who develop new technology may have different values that matter to stakeholders. Today, we will take a deep dive into this very theme. And I'm hoping that we will have an equally interactive webinar as the first one with lots of questions from you. In this webinar, we have participants representing researchers, students, service personnel, alumni and key stakeholders, as well as other friends of Aalto University. And you can submit your questions via the chat function. What I will do next is to give an introduction to today's theme. And thereafter, I will invite our first guest, Christina Sweet, to the stage. She will be followed by our second guest, Sami Itani. And we will have a joint discussion with both of them. So let me start by giving you some background to today's theme. The society around us is becoming increasingly diverse. Finnish companies operate on a global market and universities such as Aalto University have become more and more international in terms of non-Finnish faculty and students. However, we have in Finland a lot of talent that is available but that is not efficiently used. And without commitment to inclusion of diverse people, organizations will simply lose this valuable talent at a high speed. In fact, many forces work against their diversity and inclusion. For example, traditional gender roles continue to guide young people's choices of specialization in universities. And after graduation, if you happen to have a non-Finnish name, it may be a real hurdle on the job market. In contemporary organizations, diversity and inclusion often go together, like in today's webinar. But these two concepts have distinct meanings. Diversity refers to categories of individuals that are different, let's say, by gender, nationality, age, 
ethnic origin or physical ability. Some of these categories are visible, while others, such as cognitive diversity, are more hidden. In research, the theme of equality has been replaced with diversity and inclusion. And organizations of all kinds justify diversity and inclusion with sound business arguments. In other words, it makes economic sense to take diversity and inclusion seriously. But let's say recruiting an Indian software engineer to a Finnish engineering company may not bring the expected cognitive diversity. Two engineers, even if they are of different nationality, tend to think too much alike. Therefore, it may make more sense to combine individuals from different educational backgrounds to foster innovation. At Aalto University, many research groups study diversity and inclusion. To give you an example, at the School of Business, we explore social exclusion of more mature entrepreneurs and we study language diversity in multinational corporations that are dominated by English. At the School of Arts, Design and Architecture, our colleagues problematize the traditional gender categories of women and men in fashion studies. They also work at the crossroads of disability studies and contemporary art education to advance social justice. And in the fields of science and technology, researchers are really worried that people don't get exposed to diverse viewpoints because social media becomes so quickly very polarized and selective. And some Alto colleagues even study how interpersonal understanding can be enhanced by synchronizing brain activity between people. It is truly fascinating to realize that research on diversity and inclusion is truly multidisciplinary. Now, let me turn to management practice. Diversity is about bringing minorities to the workplace. But diversity does not stick without inclusion. Diversity will not lead to success unless the organization has an inclusive culture. While diversity can be legislated, inclusion is very much about voluntary action what managers and colleagues do to welcome the newcomer. Are there supporting systems and structures in place in the organization? Inclusion aims at offering employees equal access to decision-making, resources and opportunities for career mobility. But inclusion is a long process. And it happens when individuals become insiders and are allowed to retain their uniqueness within teams. In other words, inclusion means creating more comfort for more people. Interestingly, recent research suggests that inclusion isn't always good or exclusion always bad. Reality is far more complex than that. Diverse individuals bring unique qualities to the workplace. That's why they are wanted. But in practice, it is often difficult to integrate diverse individuals precisely because of this uniqueness. Colleagues may not value them, and newcomers are sometimes treated as outliers or misfits. Therefore, inclusion may require changes in organizational practices, norms and structures, or individuals themselves may have to alter their professional identity. 
And such changes can be very drastic and do not come easily. So in this regard, inclusion may be achieved at a cost. Overall, research shows that diversity is much more easily achieved than inclusion, this sense of belonging. At Aalto University, we are committed to fostering diversity and inclusion among faculty, students and service personnel. One could even say that as a creative organization, diversity is part of Aalto's DNA. Dear participants in this webinar, today I will be posing the following questions to our two guests. Why are there often discrepancies between the ideals of diversity management on one hand and the actual practices at the workplace on the other? And who at the end of the day is responsible for inclusion? And what about the terms um, based on which diverse individuals are included in organizations, if at all? Do they have to make sacrifices to fit in? Is diversity inclusion actually just another American management fashion that multinational corporations spread around the world? Or perhaps it's a rhetorical game that organizations have to play these days in order to be seen as modern and progressive. Our two guests this morning, Kristina Sweet and Sami Itani, will be answering these questions and your questions submitted via the chat function from multiple perspectives. They will approach the theme from the viewpoint of large multinational corporations, startup companies, as well as non governmental organizations. They will also discuss the topic from the viewpoint of an insider as well as an outsider. Now it's time for me to welcome our first guest, Kristina Sweet, please. Good morning. Good morning. And Kristina, you are a mother of three boys who were all born uh, in different countries. You grew up on a large cattle farm in rural Alberta in Canada, and you have lived and worked in four different countries. Half of your career you did in large multinationals, such as the Canadian largest oil and gas company, National Railway, but also Kone Corporation, the Finnish multinational. Now these organizations are traditionally in male dominated fields. And you have also worked in multiple NGOs, mainly in the area of international trade. And for the last five years, you've spent as, as a, the last five years you spent as a founder and CEO of your own company in Finland. And today you represent here the shortcut. In addition, Kristina is the president of the Finnish Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for coming and a warm welcome. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. And thank you everyone for having me today and, and allowing you to share allowing me to share a bit about my journey and, and my interest and, and engagement in diversity and inclusion. Um, I thought to walk through a little bit about sort of my my own journey and experiences and, and uh, when I was very young, um, six years old, um, my cousin, who was also my best friend, was involved in a, a horrific accident, which resulted in her being um, a triplegic. Um, and most of her young life was spent in and out of hospitals, and I became uh, her social network. And as she grew up and navigated uh, a new world, um, in her case, uh, diversity being more of a physical challenge, uh, I got to see very closely and very personally um, how inclusion and, and, and society was built, um, mainly for mainstream or, or sort of traditional folks. Um, I think that uh, her great misfortune was a blessing in many cases 
longer term because it allowed us to sort of view world the world in a in a in a different way. Um, and so, if I think about um, my current perspective, it's that experience has shaped tremendously um, how I see things, how I view things, and also the voice with which I give to things. Um, it's very important to me and to my family. Um, also being a woman um, and now a foreigner uh, leads to that experience. Um, I've had the great fortune of working um, many fantastic jobs throughout my career and, and I've worked in a lot of sort of male dominated industries, um, manufacturing, transportation, oil and gas and defense. And uh, I was coming straight, straight from university um, out of production planning and business operations, which at the time was also uh, quite male dominated. And I landed into the world of SAP right out of high school, or excuse me, right out of university. Um, and my journey then had led me to work in mainly male dominated teams and male dominated leadership. And because I was so young, I never really acknowledged or recognized sort of the uniqueness of my situation. I was a very young woman working at quite um, high leadership. Uh, I was 24 working at, at next level down from the executive team in, in uh, National Railway of Canada. And I never uh, sort of took a, a, la a, a picture of the landscape with which I was working and I just uh, embraced being young and being female and chasing my ambition and my passions. Um, and that then led me uh, to being headhunted by Kone. And Kone moved me uh, from Canada to Brussels to their international headquarters uh, to work on an SAP project there. Um, and my experience as a foreigner was spectacular. I, w I was working with over 50 nationalities. There were 200 people in the office. And Brussels itself is a very um, multinational or diverse community. So uh, when I began sort of my journey as a foreigner, I wasn't really uh, the anomaly. I was, I was the norm. But that did not pre prepare me at all uh, for when I moved to Finland. Um, I moved here and, and right away I found the struggles um, that a lot of foreigners face. I had a privileged background in many cases. I had a Finnish partner. Um, I had a history of Finnish company um, and I still struggled immensely um, to find some work um, it, to the point where I, when I left Kone, uh, I was vice president and I ended up having to take um, an analyst job, which I loved, but it was well below what I was capable of. And I again had to start from scratch and rebuild my career. Um, and along the way, uh, <laughs> I've had many wonderful jobs here in Finland and, and I've built a tremendous network. But when COVID hit, um, my company suffered tremendously and I found myself looking for work again. Um, and while I naively assumed I had built the bridges and the networks that I needed, I was quickly forced to reckon with the fact that, um, again, me being a foreigner became a challenge, mainly in language, but I was also in the conundrum of being um, overqualified for any analyst or, or um, entry jobs, but I didn't have the language skills for some of the strategic or leadership teams. And so again, I was forced um, to start over. Along my journey, though, I was very fortunate to um, have a connection with the Herlin family and I was working for them. And even though I had the patriarch of the Herlin family, um, for those of you maybe not in Finland, it's a, one of the most powerful business families here in Finland, um, I still wasn't able to make headway uh, with, with my uh, job search. But uh, I found the right people, I networked like heck, um, and I was able to sort of um, use the adaptability and agility that I've learned through my career to, to find work here in Finland. Um, and I think that um, being a foreigner here in Finland, you need to be a bit of a chameleon. I think if you approach finding work um, and finding networks and, and purpose in a traditional way, you just won't get the traction or won't get the traction fast enough. Um, and so um, what I try to, to encourage people to do is find the balance of promoting your difference while at the same time being the exact same as your national counterparts, which is a very, very fine balance uh, or fine, precarious walk to make. Uh, I think that there are a lot of challenges uh, when it comes to diversity and inclusivity here in Finland. I think that um, there's definitely sort of 
systemic bias. Um, we also have a culture of comfort. The easier choice is sometimes or quite often the, 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 the best choice. We have a risk averse uh, decision population. And we also have some political allegiances um, that are uh, less open to migration. And all of these sort of build um, the path or the challenge to slower progress um, here in Finland. This fall, I joined the Shortcut. Um, we're based here in Helsinki, and the Shortcut's mission is to um, pr promote diversity and inclusivity, and we focus mainly on highly educated foreigners here in Finland. Uh, we teach people um, to navigate the challenges of being a foreigner looking for work in Finland or moving into entrepreneurship by upskilling a uh, challenging mindset and building or giving them a community. Um, most of the folks who come through us are vulnerable at different um, phases. It might be that they feel lonely or invisible, uh, missing their professional purpose. There might be financial vulnerability. And our job is to acknowledge that vulnerability and help them be brave and confident and use the skills that they have um, to find meaningful, purposeful work here in Finland. Um, and our mission is really to create a legion of talented, diverse uh, foreign workers in Finland to really prove to the Finnish economy the value um, and the worth that we will bring both um, to the companies but to society at large. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Kristina, for sharing with us your story. Um, as, as you mentioned, uh, the Finnish economy is at the moment growing slowly and the workforce is shrinking. Uh, we have many sectors where the foreigners are seen as the solution. But from your experience, why is the Finnish labour market so difficult to penetrate for people like yourself? Uh, I, I think there's multiple reasons why. I, an obvious one is language. Um, I think that, um, as I firmly believe, we, we are here in Finland a, a community or culture of, of comfort. And I think that there's worry that language would become a hindrance in, um, for folks, mainly in their existing team, not so much for the folk, for the foreigner joining the team, but they don't want to add more pressure to folks. Um, I think it's also uh, a mix. Uh, there are systemic and, and bureaucratic challenges that make finding work difficult. Um, which, you know, if we look at, at the student visas, for example, a, a lot of times people don't have enough time to really build a network. We also have challenges, for example, um, I understand that in, in a master's program, foreign students can't work, which means they're not building their professional networks, whereas local folks can. So we kind of build these, these structural problems. Um, and I think that um, we also have maybe in the Usima area more of an openness to migration, whereas in some parts of the country less. And so the politicians need to walk a very fine balance about the policies that they're putting forward, which I think really slows sort of the, the, necess the necessary changes that we need to have to really drive immigration, in, especially into the channels where we have shortages. Mm. And now I forgot to mention that if you have questions to Christina, you are very free to s submit them via the chat. Um, now, based on your experience, Christina, which organizations in Finland are the most open-minded to recruit foreigners? And, and why do you think that's the case? Well, I think it, naturally the multinationals, um, um, because of the nature of their work, and, and often they work in English, is and they also have resources um, to put towards that. But I think if we look uh, sort of more domestically, uh, not-for-profits and startups or growth companies tend to be more accessible for, for foreigners. Um, and I believe part of that is because... Um, a lot, oftentimes the work is, is international. There's also um, more willingness for foreigners to look at those positions because they're, they need to widen their scope from traditional employment. Um, and there's also tremendous uh, opportunities. You know, startups usually work in English, for example, and, and there's a lot of value and, and um, basically they're easy, more easily accessible for foreigners. Um, the red tape is less. And mm. 
And they're usually smaller companies, which means they have slightly different labor legislation as well. Yeah, that, that's an interesting area, I think, and surely something that would be worth actually doing research into the kind of organizations that are this open minded. Uh, now, you come from Canada. And Canada is often seen as the example of of, multi, of a multicultural society. Um, you you covered some of the systemic and structural barriers that we have here in Finland. Is there some something we could learn from the Canadian example? I. <laughs> To be very honest, I mean, I haven't worked in Canada for 20 years. And when I did work there, um, I was quite naive uh, to the overall scenario. But I think th the general premise that in Canada we, we um, absorb new cultures, we don't try and force new cultures into our way of working. And, and while it's really meant for sort of... A, social system, uh, social environments and, and the communities, I think it also applies in corporate world as well. Um, I think that we allow people to uh, bring their best assets of diversity in, in culture and different ways of thinking, as you mentioned before. You know, when you're educated differently and you're brought up differently, you oftentimes have a different perspective. And, and in Canada, we try to encourage that. There are many issues uh, surrounding diversity and inclusivity in Canada. Um, but I think that the general principle is that we strive to really um, foster this, this thought process of a multicultural environment, a melting pot. Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting idea that one sort of shouldn't strive for convergence, but rather really, really embrace this mul multiplicity mm. of cultures and, and voices. Uh, now, when you arrived in Finland 11 years ago, you mentioned that you took on a job as an analyst. Um, why did you do that since it was clearly below your competence level and qualifications? It was the only job made available to me, to be honest. I mean, I, I would have loved to have a lateral move, but it just wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't available to me. And, and I needed to make sure that I was able to provide for my family. Um, but also I was... You, I needed professional purpose, and it seemed like the right path to get me at least back into the workforce. Hmm. Uh, at the moment, you are the CEO of Shortcut, and uh, and I remember you mentioned when when we were preparing for this webinar that you were actually recruited uh, through anonymous uh, an anonymous recruitment process. Now that is not very common in Finland. Could you tell us a little bit about the advantages of this approach and your experience of it? Sure, and, and I say this is from my perspective because of course I wasn't on the backside of the recruitment, but um, I didn't know at the start that it was an anonymous perspective, but the process was that all the CVs were submitted. Um, there was an external um, team that was cleaning out anything that would sort of uh, indicate any any gender or, or foreignality or anything like that. And, and we were put forward, there was close to 100 applicants and 11 were selected, seven ended up being women. Um, and from those 11, uh, from those candidates, what they found most was that the, the women had put more specificity into um, the application and, and the CV. So. I think because we're used to some of the, we have to navigate, as a woman, you have to navigate the world differently than a man and you need to be more precise. And they, the general consensus was that the women had put more sort of uh, persona personalization into the process than the men did. Mm. Uh, from, the, from the seven went to three, um, the, the process was uh, former CEO board and then the team had the final say. And it was only when we met the team did they know where we were from and, and our gender. Mm. Uh, now, we have a question from Marta to you. And, and Marta is asking, when you were working as an analyst in Finland, were you valued for the uniqueness or were you pressured to blend in? That's a good question. It's a wonderful question. I, I was working, I was valued for my uniqueness. So I think, I, of course, I can't speak directly for them, but I believe that my 
um, English as a, as a native language was one of the bigger reasons. And also my, um, the fact that I had lived and worked in, in four countries. Um, although when I was interviewing, I was under tremendous pressure to blend in. Tremendous pressure. It was like, how do you fit? I, so many times I've heard this, how will you fit with our team? Yeah. That was always sort of the commonality out of that. Mm. But the job was for my uniqueness, yes. Mm. And, and Ines actually has a related question. Um, Ines is asking, who do you think from your experience is more reluctant to inclusion? Management, staff, colleagues or teams? Um, she's referring to her own experience, saying that when I was headhunted, Uh, by the CEO of an organization with no other foreigners in the company. The diversity basically started from her, but inclusion didn't. The rest of the organization was not prepared for this. I think that's a, a wonderful question. And, and I would say, in my experience, it depends. Um, if the team has never worked with um, sort of a, a a profile that's not like their own, that might be a challenge. Um, I've also experienced where the CEO puts out a mandate and the hiring managers um, choose a, a more traditional hiring process or hiring domestically or, or locally. Um, but in, in my overall experience, I think, as, as you maybe mentioned, the diversity is one thing, but the inclusivity and um, making sure that work with purpose and belonging is really key. And I think that we, on the back end, have a lot of folks leaving Finland because they don't feel like they belong. Mm. And I think that uh, as a, the leadership need to mandate not only what, what the stats say, but also the behavior and making sure that they're not losing talent because people don't feel like they belong. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, of course, a broader societal Indeed. problem. Now, uh, let me thank you at this point. Uh, I'll invite you later again on stage. And uh, now I will introduce our second thank speaker. You. Thank you very much, Christine. And we'll save some of these questions for later. So let me invite Sami Itani. Please, Sami. Thank you, Rebecca. Sami, to use the diversity language, is a 33-year-old father of, of two boys and who was raised in a Finnish-Lebanese family. Uh, Sami is a former national team athlete in Decathlon and he ended his sports career in 2015. He has now started his third year as the president of the Finnish Athletics Federation. Sami has a PhD from Aalto University and since 2016 he has worked at the Swiss ADECO group in the Finnish management team and most recently as the CEO of the group's Finnish operations. And Sami has also published two books in management and leadership uh, in the context of multinationals as well as sports organizations. A warm welcome, Sami. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And um, thank you for, for Alta and uh, Kaude for, for this invitation. I, I find myself incredibly lucky and privileged uh, to discuss about these topics. And uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, I can share my, let's say, five penny, pennies with, uh, with you guys in the audience and you can le learn something new from, from my view, viewpoints. But uh, I want to highlight that despite I'm speaking about uh, diversity and inclusion in multinationals and in NGOs, I do not have that huge extensive uh, uh, experience yet. But uh, I believe that be being in, in, a, in a key roles anyway in a few organizations has, has taught me some, uh, some skills and anyway opened my, my worldview in many ways. But uh, if we start about my, my personal view, I, I definitely believe that uh, diversity and inclusion related questions are primarily uh, value and world, worldview related questions for me. Uh, definitely, I find this worldview a personal asset uh, in my work life. And uh, uh, also, also as, as a CEO of the, of the ADECO group here in Finland, uh, I touch upon these topics almost every day at work. And uh, diversity and inclusion 
uh, as a value question means that it penetrates through my whole life in a way, no matter if it's about my professional life, my positions of trust, my private life. But also I, I do my best, I don't know if I succeed, but I do my best to promote these topics in, in public as well. Now, in, in many ways, I definitely have to have to admit that I'm, I'm privileged. I'm not only a male nowadays, still, unfortunately, in, in work life, it tends to be a benefit. Uh, I don't know. My parents' socioeconomic background favors me. Uh, my height might favor me. But anyway, I want to I want to highlight that the deeper we scrutinize the people around us, uh, the better we understand that there is absolutely no normative ideal as such. Uh, there is some aspects in all of us that make us make us uh, somehow somehow uh, a minority mi minority group representative. And for example, uh, me, I, I I have a funny family name. I immigrant background from from my dad's side. Uh, the fact that I'm an athlete or used to be a pro athlete, I obviously thought that it's a big asset for me. But when I came to the work life, I realized that uh, pretty soon that the hiring managers don't necessarily think alike. So I had to, had to uh, in a way in a way justify myself. Or also the fact that I'm PhD, obviously a massive asset. But still, I might be perceived as too theoretical because of my research background and uh, possibly lacking uh, pragmatic uh, practical skills. Definitely not true. Uh, however, in my, my personal case, I, I do believe that luck has played uh, a crucial role. Uh, I'm, I've been lucky enough to have people around me who have, regardless of my background, uh, who have trusted me and uh, given me possibilities. And I've been, I've been, I guess, brave enough to take the possibilities uh, and hence, hence uh, find myself in suitable jobs nowadays. But uh, if we speak about, speak about uh, multinationals, now earlier Rebecca was, was uh, uh, pinpointing the different ways of defining and conceptualizing diversity. And this is very good and very important to do uh, in order to have a proper conversation. Uh, we need to define what is diversity in the first place. And uh, my employer, the ADECO Group, it's uh, one of the largest firms in the, in the whole world. It's a Swiss Fortune 500 firm. And the, the picture you see back there is one way to conceptualize it. It's, it's how we perceive it, uh, diversity and inclusiveness uh, at, at the ADECO Group. But uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, similar, similar, uh, similar uh, pictures are used in other firms as well. But in any way, uh, inclusiveness in a business context, context is making the diverse team perform. So diversity as such uh, is not necessarily uh, useful if it's not thoroughly managed and incorporated into the company culture. So inclusiveness in a business context is actually making diversity, turning it into profitability, more or less. So it's uh, definitely uh, also a, a value, a moral, moral question, but it's also a, a financial question for the big corporations nowadays. And uh, I definitely believe that the advanced companies, uh, Christina just said that the multinationals tend to be a bit, bit more advanced quite often than, than the small SMEs, the domestic firms. Uh, but I definitely believe that the big multinationals uh, who are front runners, they don't see diversity as a mercy as CSR anymore, but it's thoroughly, thoroughly strategic, uh, strategic uh, issue for, for these companies. And uh, they definitely, definitely systematically measure uh, diversity re related questions. Uh, they set concrete targets. And also, what is important, they reward people, no matter if it's a, in the management or on, on a ground floor level, from, from uh, uh, concrete success in diversity and inclusiveness questions. Now, quite often in multinationals, we speak about inclusive leadership uh, playing a key role. Uh, what the leadership does or thinks is important. Now, obviously, this is the case, but quite often we forget the owners and the board who represents the owners. Uh, I, I believe that essentially it is the board, for example, in the multinationals, who define the strategy. And they represent the, the owner's voice. Uh, and the management is merely executing the strategy def defined by the, by the board. So we shouldn't forget the owners. And for example, we have a couple hundred uh, viewers here in this webinar. I'm, I'm sure that many of you own 
uh, own some shares and can be perceived as owners as well. So your voice should be heard in, in practice in corporations as well. And also when it comes to uh, management involvement, I think that the fact that uh, if we have lower hierarchies, both cultural subjective hierarchies and concrete uh, organizational objective hierarchies, uh, the better the leadership commitment is actually seen on the ground floor. Because quite often the people don't, uh, don't necessarily know what the leadership even thinks due to bad communication or high power distances. And then briefly about NGOs as well. Now Finnish Athletics Federation is uh, obviously uh, known by some of you as one of the, one of the most established uh, and largest NGOs in Finland. Uh, and uh, I can speak about NGOs in the context of sport, but I definitely believe that there are similarities, similarities between sports and NGOs representing, I don't know, science or culture or, or uh, arts, for example. But there are many differences between NGOs and uh, MNCs in general when it comes to DI questions. Uh, now, first of all, the le legislation is different in, in Finland, whether, whether you represent an RU NGO or uh, OU corporation. Uh, decision making is way different. Uh, and for example, the management or the people in the position of trust, uh, they have significantly less leeway in making, let's say, authoritarian decisions if they feel like it. Uh, but we always have to rely on the formal NGO rules that are defined more or less democratically. So this is a big, big difference between NGOs and uh, MNCs. And also, uh, I, want to, I want to bring forth that uh, the history and culture as such in NGOs is quite different quite often. The NGOs in Finland, at least the large ones, ones they can have a history of 100, 150 years, whereas the corporations might be more agile culture-wise because uh, of a lesser historical burden. And also in NGOs, you tend to work with volunteers, which means that there is notably more passion and mission in a way involved in, in people's action. Uh, I'm not saying that there couldn't be passion in, in uh, corporations as well, but in NGOs it's, it's, it's uh, something that really uh, strikes, strikes when you enter one. Now NGOs, they touch upon almost all of us here in Finland. Only sports NGOs alone have 1.2 million members in Finland. Uh, Finnish Athletics Federation has roughly 100,000 people uh, involved in our activities every single week, week in Finland. Well, obviously now in COVID times it changes <laughs> depending on the restrictions, but anyway, we touch upon the lives of so many. Uh, and NGOs are in many ways, I think, a little bit lacking behind. Uh, in DI questions uh, in, uh, when we compare with the corporations. And uh, I think we are still focusing mostly on gender issues. Uh, but they are a, a good low hanging fruit to start with and very important. And for example, in, in, at the Ad Athletics Federation, uh, I'm really proud that we were the first major federation in Finland to introduce gender quotas in, uh, in our boards and positions of trust and uh, management, management roles as well. And uh, soon other similar organizations and NGOs started to follow. And uh, all in all, the environment of NGOs is really changing fast. Like the expectations of all the internal and external uh, stakeholders are changing so fast that I believe that those NGOs that do not adjust uh, into the changing environment can actually face an extinction uh, in quite a short time. So one, one decade of bad management can in a way cause uh, losing a whole NGO with 100 years of history. And uh, I definitely do my best that uh, the NGOs that I represent won't face this, face this faith uh, in the upcoming 10 years. But yeah, this, uh, this was my five pennies to start with. And uh, uh, please shoot me with tricky questions and most of all challenge my viewpoint if, if you feel like it in the, in the audience and Rebecca as well. Thank you very much, Sami. And, and we have actually received lots of wonderful questions, so I think I'll, okay. I'll start with them. Uh, Luis is asking, uh, do you think the situation in Finland uh, today compared to 10 years ago is, is better or worse? And what is the direction of diversity and inclusion if we look into the future? Yeah, uh, well, I I in my mind, in a way it's getting better when it comes to 
uh, realizing the fact that uh, we live in a global global society and there is no way of going back to the to the uh, times where everything was homogenic that actually never existed but still so in that sense people have realized that this is the way we need to enter and uh, whether you like it or not we need to do it as, as well as possible but at the same time I'm very concerned personally about the in a way the not only the public discussion and you spoke about polarization of social media etc uh, but let's say the spiritual climate in, in Finland. I think it's getting poorer uh, and this impacts uh, DEI related questions uh, and for example the policymakers have, I don't think they can necessarily execute their will or even the business leaders uh, because they are afraid of the public opinion uh, which is quite often quite harsh and dominated by a very small group of people. So uh, it is getting both better and worse. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, indeed. And, and we've seen examples of, of social movements recently on the financial markets as well. True. And the power of these movements. Mm. Uh, Jaakko is asking how to build an inclusive culture in practice. And, and could you give an example from, from ADECO, for example, yeah. of, of, of practices that have taken the company towards a more inclusive culture? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, we measure uh, these, also these subjective uh, kind of atmosphere, atmosphere kind of things uh, consistently all over the world. Uh, we have monthly pulse, pulse questions for, for, for the whole stuff uh, where, we, where we focus a lot on diversity and inclusive kind of questions. Whether you feel like you have the right to be who you are, is it, is it a free organization to be a different kind of personality? And also, for example, great place to work questionnaires are, are focusing on these. And I'm very proud that uh, despite we, like every organization, have a lot of problems as well. But globally, this is our seventh consecutive year when we have been ranked as, the, as one of the top 10 uh, best employers in the world. And I think it's partially because of the inclusive culture. So consistently measuring it, but also transparently speaking, the, uh, speaking about the results is important. And good practices, for example, uh, when it comes to transparency, uh, we make it very transparently uh, uh, available for all the colleagues in the organization that uh, in this kind of middle managerial roles or consultant roles or sales roles, the women get paid on average this much and the men on that much. That much. So transparency is in, important, definitely. And uh, uh, one thing I want to, want to highlight is that I feel that the, the global leadership is definitely in, uh, committed to diversity and inclusion, for example, because I, as a CEO, have a very thorough, thorough succession planning in place. And uh, I need to have uh, diverse succession uh, candidates, successor candidates. It's not whether I want it or not, I do want it, but it's also a requirement from the group. So, for mm. example, that kind of practices. Mm. But still, despite all this measurement and transparency, a number of diversity and inclusion initiatives fail. Mm. Why is that? Well, uh, quite often because of bad communication, I believe. Mm -hmm. But it's also because people are often suffocated by new initiatives and data. And if you look at the intraweb of any global corporation, we have new initiatives coming every single day. and it would be important to uh, select and focus a fewer of them and do them properly. So I, I think that is one reason why they, why they fail. Uh, other, uh, other is the fact that, well, there might be some shareholders over there as well. You, you ten, tend to expect results fast. Uh, and hence the management of multinationals are incentivized to do short-term business. And uh, DEI related questions are often long term business. So uh, if I if I get bonuses, I'm not saying I do, but it, let's say hypothetically that I, I got bonuses for three months at a time, de depending on the performance, instead of one or two or four years. Obviously, it steers those initiatives which are low hanging fruits and commercially directly uh, to be priorities. So I think uh, the owners uh, and hence uh, the board should be more long term oriented to ensure that uh, DEI related practices would actually become priorities. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we have a question from Mariana asking whether in your experience there is added pressure on foreigners to be mm. like model employees, model citizens in order to ensure that that they are included? Yeah, that is a really good question from Mariana. Uh, definitely there is added pressure. Uh, I think it's the same if, if you're a woman or uh, if you have if you're a, a minority of any kind. Well, women are not minorities, but still. Uh, uh, and I, I can see I, I don't obviously I'm, I'm lucky since I'm native Finnish speaking. I was born here, etc. So I am not a foreigner as such, although I have my uh, background, uh, uh, international background. But when I look at, for example, my parents, they wor work in the same profession. And I think in the beginning of uh, my father's career, he really had to prove that he's better than any of the na native Finnish, Finnish doctors in, uh, in, in his job. But nowadays, after 35 years, he doesn't have to do it anymore. So I guess things are getting better. But definitely there is added pressure on, on foreigners. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah. And not everybody has the patience to wait for 35, 35 years. years yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't know whether you want to respond to Valentina's question about diversity in academia. Mm. Um, how do you feel about that? It's a different kind of an organization or workplace. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I, I used to used to work at Alto and, uh, uh, and study there. And I sincerely believe that the culture is more inclusive than than in some places in business that I've been subsequently. Uh, and I think it's partially because obviously the, the staff is more international and the students are more inter international than the corporation leaders are in Finland, for example. So it plays a role. But also the fact that uh, in academia, when it comes to research, to teaching to some extent as well, uh, everything is done more or less in global or regional teams. So if you don't have an understanding for, for uh, uh, inclusiveness, I, I don't think you can be able to cope and perform in academia. And hence, that kind of people possibly faster leave the market than in business, for example. So I, I, I'm sure that there are problems in academia as well. But the situation on average, at least at Aalto, is better than in most businesses. And, and universities are, are really international employee, employers these days, both in terms of, well, particularly in terms of faculty, but also mm. students. Um, now, Gustav is asking, I had a hiring manager telling me that he tried to recruit foreigners as he found that the knowledge pool there was better and often untapped. Do you have any concrete examples of how to spread such thinking, such positive thinking, around recruiters? Well, I, I, I think good, good examples. Uh, the, the Bosch radio in, in Finnish, Puska radio, is, is always the most impactful one. Because uh, even if we have these fancy PowerPoints and uh, formal uh, placards in, in organizations, they are not as plausible as if somebody who you, who you trust has a positive experience. So uh, that is definitely the best way to go Go, go ahead that those people who, who have good experiences, they share them more openly with, with others. Uh, and obviously, obviously the top leadership in the organization needs to promote that, that as well. Because if they don't, I don't think the middle managers, for example, or the hi hiring managers don't have the courage to, to speak what they really, really think and believe uh, if they feel that they, they might be in jeopardy in terms of the leadership, top leadership. Mm. Now, um, you have spent 15 years of your life in competitive sports as a decathlonist, Sami. And uh, I'd like to ask you how diversity plays out in competitive sports and what can we learn from this field in terms of managing diversity and inclusion in organizations? Well, that's an excellent question. I, I guess sports is, uh, to the outside world, it's mostly about results. I mean, those who are in it, they understand that it's quite a little, not much about the results, but to the outside world, it's either about winning or, or losing. Uh, so it essentially doesn't look too, too inclusive or diverse. But it, in reality, uh, it doesn't matter at all in sports whether your ethnic background is 
from here or there or, or your gender doesn't necessarily matter that much. Uh, your social economic background, whether you come from poverty or from bourgeois, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't matter. So I, in, in a way, I feel that uh, in sports, the, there is more, more in, uh, inclusiveness inherently already. And I, I, I believe that athletes are changing quite rapidly nowadays. They, they are more eager to promote their own values and in a way benefit their uh, personal brand. And a concrete example is from last, uh, last fall and the American US presidential elections. Uh, in these few pivotal states, Vankieli or Savaltio, uh, like Pennsylvania, Georgia, uh, Wisconsin, the, the top professional teams collectively and systematically promoted openly political views, uh, not only uh, relating to Black Lives Matter, but, uh, but to, to other, uh, uh, let's say, uh, human right and, uh, and diversity and uh, uh, well-being related questions. So I think they played actually a quite notable role in the elections as well when the, when the big heroes uh, started to promote po political topics as well. So uh, yeah, I think uh, sports can play a major role in societies and, uh, and uh, we have benefits and uh, we have obstacles. Yeah. Thank you, Sami, for sharing your views. And, and let me now invite Christina back to stage and, yes. and we'll take a concluding discussion. Uh, Marie Therese is asking, how important is it to have a diverse government? So we are turning to the political side of, of society. Any, either of you can, can answer. Yeah, well, I guess it's the government is supposed in a democracy to represent the, the country. Uh, uh, so in, in that sense, if we only have one gender or one race in there, it's not plausible anymore nowadays. Uh, so it is very important. But at the same time, if let's say we have women in uh, as prime ministers, etc., et if they are steered implicitly to behave as if they were men, like Margaret Thatcher began to speak like a man, uh, then it doesn't really uh, do the favor. So I think uh, there should be really a psychological safety for the government to, to be who they are also if they represent minorities. I don't know if we are there yet. Probably not. Would you like to comment, Christina? No, I think from my perspective, uh, Finland is probably ahead of at least Canada in terms of gender curve, although when our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was sworn in, he made a, a balanced cabinet. So mm -hmm. definitely strides have been taken. Um, and I've seen recently a lot of, um, a lot, it's, it's uh, perspective of course, but a lot of foreigners running in the local elections. And I think that um, government um, should be reflective of the society that they serve. And so it's nice that we, we may have more voices to the table, not just gender mm. voices, but also cultural and, mm. and um, national voices as well. Mm. Um, I'd like to turn to the organizational level and, and ask you, who makes the decision about inclusion? And who is responsible for inclusion in organizations? I think everybody is responsible, no matter what kind of cultural uh, topic we are addressing. If somebody thinks that he or she exists in a, in a silo and vacuum, then it's not going to work. So uh, everybody plays a key role in their all, everyone in the organization. But of course, I again want to highlight the, the owner's voice over the management voice, because <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, the operative management, uh, they can steer the culture, yes. But when it comes to defining the strategy, they are more or less puppets. So it is the owners that decide and they need to be uh, in boards, especially more vocal about uh, setting targets for inclusiveness and most of all, to reward everybody in the organization if we succeed. So. I would agree with that. I would say functionally on the ground, it's whoever the alpha is of the team. And if the team has someone who's open and warm and welcoming, then the result is that you have a better um, inclus mm. inclusivity in your team. If you have someone who's less open, it can create problems. So I, I, I agree completely. It needs to come from, from top all the way down. But if there's no... Um, uh, 
if there's no carrot and stick for the folks who are actually living and breathing the daily life, then I think that, um, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the, the bosses are saying if the folks on the ground aren't behaving in the way that the, that the leadership has set the way to do. Exactly, and I think this is very much what recent research is showing, that we have sort of two bubbles, the disconnect between the top and, and then uh, the lower levels who are, as you said, leading their own life. Um, Peter is asking, um, when you mention some gender quotas, why do you think they are needed? Are there other ways mm. of, of, of building inclusion effectively without quotas? Yeah. Definitely quotas shouldn't be needed at all. <laughs> but uh, at some point, uh, at least at the Federation where I am, I, I felt that it has been 20 years when we started to discuss about uh, promoting women in the, in the leadership or in the decision-making groups. 20 years, because out of the 100,000 members, two-thirds of you know, members are women. But in the leadership, it tends to be 80 to 20 for, for men. And despite the sincere intention of having more women, uh, definitely a sincere intention, people do want it. Nothing has changed in 20 years. So hence, uh, I definitely feel that we needed first structural violence, like mm -hmm. new rules and regulations to force uh, change. And in a couple of years time, when we have had more women in leadership positions, uh, people realize that being a good leader is not a gender question, and then we can, you know, remove the quotas. Uh, and on average, I, I believe that sports, uh, sports NGOs are actually dominated quite vastly on, uh, on like masculine values. So, so it's not an easy environment as for a woman to to uh, flourish. So hence, uh, we we needed the quotas. Anna is asking about the role of middle managers, those sort of who are sandwiched in between. Uh, how can we increase their accountability in organizations? Because as you said, Christina, they are often the ones who make diversity and inclusion happen or not. Mm. Well, I think uh, coming back to uh, one of uh, the, the earlier points is that the, the the bottom line is always the driver and and so my experience has been that quite often hiring managers will choose the safer route because uh it, labor laws here in finland make it very costly and time consuming to to hire and fire so typically they will take the the less uh risky option which is the option that they know and, and can predict and, and there's security in it um, but i think that um, if leadership is, is true to their word and promoting diversity and inclusivity then they should be giving the tools and um, the influence to the folks making those decisions to to occasionally make errors or think outside the box or take uh, different choices i think we're always focused on on the budget rightly so and the bottom line and um, that sometimes is not aligned with uh, DNI mm. po processes or policies. And also when it comes to education and training, I, I think, for example, in, in, in diversity questions, the implicit biases are, are actually uh, not recognized by, by many people in the organization. So who should be trained uh, primarily and at first is definitely the middle managers because yes. uh, they, are, they are the ones who recruit most of the new or people in the organization. They are the ones who possess most of the um, sub subordinates in the organization as well. So uh, an important group indeed. Petteri yes. mm. um, was asking, uh, you whether you could make three top policy recommendations to change the atmosphere in Finland towards a more in, uh, favorable environment towards recruiting foreigners. So what would you say to policymakers in order to change the current status quo? Well, uh, I'm also <laughs> also a member uh, member at 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 Balta at, at their uh, the service sector employers uh, policy making group. So we dis touch upon these topics quite often. And nowadays, uh, a big obstacle is uh, in, in Finland is not as much the, the culture and the in a way mental attitudes people have, but also the structural challenges there are to bring uh, like 
international workforce to Finland. So there, there are a lot of changes that are needed and, and that are structural changes, in fact, and legislation changes. Uh, but also on a, on a societal level, I think we should more have better have more better cooperation between uh, the three sectors. So when it comes to D and I questions, I in a way feel that business are businesses are the brain. They often come up first with the good ideas, and the public sector is quite vastly the the limbs. They execute them. They they define the laws and uh, they educate the people. And the NGOs are, in a way, the, the, the soul or the heart of the society. Uh, they move, move the people uh, and they, there's so much passion involved. So we should enable better cooperation between the three th sectors uh, in uh, DTI related questions as well. Mm. I, I would add that I think this structural violence is necessary. I think that there is systemic bias that we have to be real about. Um, that we have to acknowledge and talk about and work to fix. Um, and that structural bias is kind of in its own pathway of bureaucratic or legislative change. And then we have more of the practical ones, like getting visas faster or giving folks longer time to find work or um, more TE offices that can support foreigners looking mm. for, like there's a lot of sort of process related things that need to happen as well. Um, but I think that we need to hold those folks making decisions for us accountable and uh, positively shame in a way and make sure that they, they know that um, in order to benefit and, and grow the Finnish economy, that this is one of the key items. Im yeah. Immigration is going to be one of the things that saves uh, our society. So we, the sooner we accept and build processes to support, I think the better society and, and business will do. Mm. Now this was actually Robe's question and not Petteri's. I misread that. Um, one of my final questions relates to uh, university corporate collaboration. And I would like to hear your views. How could the diversity and inclusion agenda be fostered through collaboration between universities such as Alto University and, and practitioners? Mm. Well, in general, I feel that there should be more cooperation. I think Alto University, the business school at least, is most business oriented school in practice in Finland. So that they are way ahead than some other business schools in Finland, but there should be more cooperation. And for instance, when it comes to case studies that the, the firms provide the students with, uh, they could be more diversity and inclusion oriented, not least because in organizations quite often the strategy makers, the decision makers represent a generation which is different from their clients and customers uh, and even suppliers. So uh, whereas the students can represent them. Uh, so in, in that sense, that's one way to, to uh, enhance the cooperation. So better case studies focusing on this particular topic. And uh, sort of a, a practical tip from both of you, C could you suggest one small thing uh, that each of us could personally do uh, in our work life, well, not in the office, but <laughs> through distant remote work uh, to improve diversity in our communities? What would that little thing be that, mm. that we could do? Show recognition when you see good deeds around you. So I, I think we, we have spoken about, or, and I have, about sticks and carrots and monetary compensation and bonuses and uh, in, uh, incentives. But at the end of the day, when it comes to a question which is emotional, not only practical, but also emotional, like the AI related questions, uh, showing openly recognition, uh, when you see there's a need for it, you, we all should be more brave in, that, in those terms and uh, recognize it. Uh, and I would add that I th think that uh, a general sense of empathy um, goes a long way. Uh, I think that most people underestimate uh, the mental toil it takes on being a foreigner. Um, is in my case, especially in Finland, I've now lived in three countries and four countries, excuse me, and this has been by far the hardest to integrate into. 
And I think culturally, part of it is that it's it's kind of a, a closed society. You know, you don't necessarily have the small talk and the greetings on the street and stuff. So it can be a very lonely environment. And I think that um, even if you've never experienced that, acknowledging that we're here, you know, to make better lives for ourselves and hopefully for the, the community and the social system that, with which in, we work or, or live um, it is worthwhile. And this might be like saying, hello or looking in the eyes when you pass on the street or um, saying, oh, I know a foreigner too. And I'm the, tr I'm one of the, at one point I was one of the only Finns living in, or foreigners living in my Finnish community. And, and it meant a lot when people acknowledged it because I think pretending I'm not foreign and just pretending I'm Finn isn't helping, I think. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think as, as much as we need to highlight um, And it, I think it's a huge part to highlight the accomplishments um, and to acknowledge them. I think we also need to touch on the, the mental space and the empathy that's needed uh, to keep people here, to keep people contributing and, and growing their family and making disposable income and paying taxes and all the good things that come with more people in Finland. Mm -hmm. Let me thank you both for, for a wonderful morning, for being so frank and open, for sharing with me and the audience your views. And uh, it is time for me to conclude that it was a very li lively and, and rich discussion. There's a lot one, one could take away, but perhaps a couple of issues. Um, We've covered many different kinds of organizations uh, that, that, uh, for, for which diversity and inclusion is important. And, and what I took away was that actually the, the issue of diversity and inclusion sort of uh, cuts across multiple levels from the owners down to, the, to really the very, very sort of individual employee at the workplace. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, we've also touched upon the breadth of diversity as a as a concept. So not only gender, which is typically uh, the focus, but various aspects uh, down to physical abilities as well. Um, and and I think another takeaway for me was the importance of the middle manager. So really, those who are the doers in the organization, who can then make a big difference to the employee experience um, at the workplace. Um, at this point, I would like to thank the backstage team and I would also like to welcome you warmly to the third webinar, uh, which is on sustainable reconstruction. And that will take place at the end of March. So looking forward to your active participation and thank you for being here today.